Welcome back to Gold Derby. I'm Christopher Rosen. I'm so pleased to be joined by Hannah Beachler, the Oscar-winning production designer for Black Panther, who returned to the Marvel Cinematic Universe for this year's blockbuster sequel, Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Uh, Hannah, thank you so much for doing this. I, I appreciate it. And I, I was saying, I, lo I love your work. I, I wanted to start, like the movie does, with the, this incredible memorial for uh, T'Challa and, by extension, Chadwick Boseman. I found the sequence so beautiful. It has an already, I feel like, iconic mural design of uh, T'Challa and, and Chadwick as T'Challa. I, I, it's it's incredible. It's like I said, it's just an incredible sequence. Uh, where did you start uh, visualizing the celebration of his life, basically, in, in ways I found just incredibly moving, I guess? You know, well, it started with Ryan. You know, me, Ryan, and Ruth, I would say, or Ruth, Ryan, and I, you know, started talking about, and with Nate Moore, the producer, started talking about what you know, Ryan envisioned, you know, first of all, were we going to do something like that? That was a lot of the conversation. Um, and then, yes, we, we, you know, thinking about sort of, <clears throat> when you think about how communities grieve and myself being from New Orleans, you know, we have the jazz funeral, we have second lines and, and grieving is really a, a, a celebration as well as um, mourning. And when you look throughout the diaspora, you find that that's, that's very much the same in many <clears throat> African cultures and um, Caribbean cultures. So throughout the diaspora, you're finding this way of sort of processional um, and uh, music and the celebration of life along with mourning. So we wanted to do that. We talked to several, you know, um, experts um, in West African cultures and, you know, Ryan and Ruth, uh, you know, talked about the what wearing the white and what that meant um, spiritually, um, sort of the cleansing of white, the, uh, you know, how the ancestors come into that color, you know, have Ancestors Day in New York um, and, every, and the women were white. So, and then it was really for me, you know, where is this taking place? And we talked about um, previously, Denai Guerrero's character, where she lived in Golden City, being the general of the Dora Milaje. And I was like, well, you know, she's super traditional. She would live in the most, the oldest part of town, which on the previous movie we had said was North Triangle when I started to lay out, you know, the, the, the country and the, and the capital and the districts. And, you know, of course you always kind of have the oldest part of town, right? And we wanted to have that in Golden City. So, you know, what did that consist of? It was also sort of a place where people could come and remember Bishinga, as we know, the first Panther, which you'll see in the statues on the, um, you know, triangular uh, walls, which we call Triangle Park, um, being it is North Triangle. And um, you see Bishinga and his queen with two resting Panthers. And then you go inside and you see the Rondavel inside, which is meant to be Bishinga's Rondavel, although it is, um, influenced by um, Nelson Mandela's birthplace and um, the Rondavel that he was born in. So, you know, and then we, we started talking about, um, would there be some type of memorial that the people did like a mural? Um, and, you know, we thought about, <clears throat> you know, for instance, when Kobe Bryant passed away tragically, um, you know, Los Angeles, beautiful murals of him and his daughter went up everywhere. And I think it's another way for people to express their uh, mourning and their grieving. And we wanted to do the same, you know, but we wanted it to be an image of Chadwick, um, not necessarily of Panther, um, you know, so we could celebrate the, the chief, the king, um, as well as the man. So uh, Brandon Sadler, who was the muralist for Shuri's lab on the first Panther for the beautiful um, mural in the middle, and he um, painted that mural, you know, we, it took a long time. I think there was a lot of emotion behind it and um, to sort of, you know, figure out what that was going to be and what that was going to look like. See, we only had a day to do it hmm. uh, in the rain. <laughs> So he wow. did a beautiful, beautiful mural, you know, driven by passion. And he was up on a condor and we put some plastic sheeting over him. And, you know, he started first thing in the morning and got done right as the sun went down. And, um, you know, and it just turned out beautifully. And, 
And, you know, not, not all the actors knew that that was there. So when they came to the set, there was another moment, you know, for them to sort of like take that in. And I think all the extras as well. And, um, you know, that, that set in itself is a lot about Zimbabwe, which is Denai Guerrero's home country. So that's uh, a lot of the look that's there. Wow. I, I would, I mean, it's such a, what, like in the theater and you, I watched it. It's just like, it. it's like, I've never heard a theater so silent and like reverence for that scene. And like, just the whole opening is just, it's really beautiful. And like, I mean, that mural is just amazing and all of it is so great. The, you mentioned like all this detail and stuff. The thing I noticed too, watching the movie is it so much more. I mean, I thought the scope and everything is so much bigger in this movie. You're, it goes all around the world under, under the sea, obviously. I was just like, kind of blown away by that. I want, I guess you mentioned like Golden City. It feels like Golden City is so much more expanded here, right? And like I, later on that same, I, I, I'm i assuming it's the same kind of set or whatever is going to get flooded. It gets like flooded out in a big sequence or I, can you talk about like, how are you making that? I, it's just, it felt again, like so big watching it from from a viewing standpoint, I was just like, how is how am I watching this? Right. Like I was kind of like, how did they, how did they do this a little bit? How do you build a set like that and have it like literally flood out or like it like clearly is the flooding? It's not like all VFX, you know, I mean, like I'm sure that it could have been done. So I guess how do you like do that and like make it look so good? <laughs> Well, it was a giant set on a back lot. Um, we built it. Every building that you see was built. Um, some of the interiors were done. We had like a restaurant, a dentist's office. We had Denai Guerrero's home. We had the Wakandan Architects, which said Wakandan Architects, uh, Jack Kirby and Hannah Beekler. Oh. And we also had in the window of the architects, uh, we had 3D printed the original buildings that were in Secret Wars um, and made them about three foot and put them in the window. So Jack Kirby... Um, and um, we had a coffee shop and a bookstore um, and a flower shop that was Muslim huts um, that were hand carved. So, you know, we wanted to make it a real neighborhood and we needed all of those things. And we actually did flood it. So we built a wear wall um, through the buildings um, all the way around the set. And our special effects person, Dan Sudik, um, put two ginormous tanks. To give you an idea, I could stand inside of the valve Wow. That opened up. It was like a six foot valve. So I think each tank was maybe over a little, a little over half a million gallons of water um, that dispersed in 11 seconds. So they flooded it several times and that little town held up like a champ. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, all of that was practical. And I was in the water, the extras were in the water, of course, stump people. Yeah. And, um, and then they're saved by the scarab beetle and, you know, a little bit of that was done practically of, of the lift. And so there was, it was all practical. And then when you see Little River Town, where, you know, Namor walks out of the water, um, that was a new piece of um, Golden City that wasn't there before. And it sort of is like the marketplace where the people of Little River Town come and sell their wares. They come by boat because they're the river, you know, they, they're purveyors of the river. And of course, we love to explode things. So, you know, Namor gets a bunch of strikes at him on the on the shores of that. But that was essentially a giant tank. We um, went into the ground and made an 80 foot by uh, 60 foot, 10 foot tank. And then we made wear walls around that and the entire set, which were built up to four feet so we could flood it. Um, so it was basically 14 feet of water. Um, and, uh, I got to boat around in it. So that was fun. I had a stick and a boat and I was like, let me check this out. So that was, that was fun. It was another giant set. Um, we flooded the tribal council, um, several, uh, tens of thousands of gallons came into the window. We built that on a wear wall. So, um, we added the fire when, um, you see Michael B in the, um, ancestral plane. Mm -hmm. I hope I'm not spoiling anything. Yeah. And, um, so, um, we, we flooded these sets practically. We built tanks on Namor set. We put things in the water. Um, we had other tanks, of course, um, 20 foot tanks that were about 80 foot in diameter that we, all the actors would practice um, swimming and diving in. I went in and worked with a, um, a free diver and breathing and just to feel the pressure as you go down to 20 feet. Um, Ryan was in it every day, you know, it was so warm that everybody wanted to be in it. Um, you know, we did all our tests in it. We put Namor's throne, um, Maglodon jaw in it. We, you know, the scene where they're giving birth to Namor, that's practical in the tank, shot practically. Um, so in all the stuff you see in Talakan of the people underwater is shot practically. 
um, in the tank as well. So we built a lot of set pieces to go in the water and that was a new experience. <laughs> yeah, certainly. And again, it's unbelievable when you're watching because I'm just like, I like, I defi like, again, I was like totally buying in that all this is like real, even though it's like obviously a, a superhero movie. How do you, when you're, when you're building stuff and building sets that you know are going to go in water, is there something you have to do differently? I mean, obviously probably from like a water perspective, but are how visually it looks. Cause so much of this is shot like under, like we're underwater, right? Like Namor is underwater. So like, how do you, how do you think about that and how you're building this set? So it shows up on camera and like to me in the audience, like it looks awesome. So how do, how do you get from that point to the, the final product, I guess? We did a lot of tests of different materials, different colors. And I think the first thing we wanted to do was color tests you know, red drops out at a certain point and Namor's throne room is red. And um, we had to see like, what is the practicality of that? And then how do we, um, you know, decide how that red is going to work um, within the story terms. So we put down a lot of stuff um, to test uh, like sealants and things like boring stuff like that to see how to build because it was new to most of us. And, you know, we had, we had some kerfuffles every now and again, but you work through those things. And um, so it was super exciting, you know, because it was it is big. It's really big. You're you're craning giant things down into the water, and you've got your water grips that are helping it come in. And um, so there was a lot of testing, a lot of studying, a lot of trying to understand where they lived in the ocean, how deep down it was. And we went back and forth about how dark is it, how light is it, how much can you see. Talking to experts um, about like you know you see sort of the whale come out of the blue. Um, and, and that you don't have that much visibility. So we wanted to keep that reality and keep that tangible for people. Um, but we also then, we wanted to see the beautiful world. So we created lighting. Um, how are they lighting down, you know, down under so you can see um, all the beautiful things. So that was a consideration of talking about bioluminescence and how to, can you use that and what's the technology that they, um, you know, created to, to use that fiber optics and, and, um, you know, of course, they're, you know, Namor is Namor, so he might steal some fiber optics to create a system within his own community. So we did a lot of hard sci-fi as well. That's awesome. Uh, the other, you, away from the water, you also are <laughs> launching uh, Riri Williams and Ironheart here, and you have her incredible, so that's more landlocked, which is great, and you have more, and you have her incredible garage, I guess, where she's like doing all her experiments, and I just love that entire set, and that sequence is so cool, obviously, and and like, uh, I think it's like one take a lot of that in, in that scene. It's uh, Can you talk a little about that and getting, A, a like, those choices and the be knowing you're like kind of launching a nut like a nut like a character for the first time in the MCU that like people haven't seen before. I just thought that was really cool. And like I said, that set's really great and like very detailed. And I'm sure there's a lot of Easter eggs I'd imagine and stuff that I will watch and pick up on when I see this movie again and again, like everything else. But yeah, like how'd you start there? I guess. You know, a lot of it we started with the King of Riri from the comics that we know and sort of where she was from, Chicago and you know, what the car meant to her and sort of what was she studying at MIT? You know, she, her hero was Tony Stark. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of those uh, Easter eggs I won't say yet. And, you know, let it get down the road. People will figure it out. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, and so we wanted to make her sort of this, you know, Chicago um, young woman who is, you know, rivals um, Shuri when it comes to intellect and, you um, technological prowess and um so it was a lot it was you know but she's mechanical whereas you know you see Shuri being very um using very delicate instruments there a lot of technology where Riri is you know this woman who will weld and you know bang on the, you know the sequence of her creating her suit much like Tony Stark did in uh, Iron Man 1 and um you know there's that parallel that Ryan really thought about and so we wanted to make sure her space, her garage felt very mechanic, mm -hmm. um, mechanical because her first uh, Mach 1 suit is kind of moshed together, right? And so you'll see like the finer things like the 3D printers and, you know, she's making things um, that seem every day, but out of materials that aren't usually used. So we have all the, 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 melt, the, the welding shop, the 3D printers, um, her little hangout area, um, and then the the car, and and then the of course the 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 suit, the Mach One, and so yeah, we kind of approached her more down to earth, more we wanted her to be a little opposite of of Shuri in the way she sort of looked at technology and the way she looked at 
engineering. And um, so, yeah, you know, it was fun. We recreated her dorm room at, at MIT and um, put a lot of fun stuff in there. We, we really, we went to Georgia Tech and we got with a lot of the um, students there, the engineering students. Um, and they were in the, in the mechanic students and they were great. And they kind of talked to us about what the plans would look like and, you know, let us borrow some of their little gadgets and stuff to put all around her, her room. And so I don't know, maybe you'll see it again. I don't know. I can't oh, say I'll definitely, much. <laughs> I'll definitely see it again. I don't, <laughs> I don't think I can say much about what, <laughs> what all of those things become. Yeah, that's <laughs> fine. It's great. So, I mean, obviously I'm not a surprise that it all is going to be bigger and, you know, that's right. that. you, you mentioned Ryan, obviously I know you've like, I, you worked with him from Fruitvale station. So like you've had a long relationship with him creatively when you won your Oscar, which you have a great speech and people should watch it if they haven't watched it recently. I've watched it before we did this. And you mentioned how like he helped you find agency and self-worth, I believe is what you said. I mean, can you talk about like how your relationship, like how important that relationship is? And like, especially I found this movie, like, for all the things I love about it, obviously it's so much about like black women, the strength of black women. And like, it's so fo forward with that. Like, obviously like it's Shuri and, 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 and all the other characters, it's just really great. So I guess, can you talk about, you know, like how you kind of like have evolved with him in your career and just like that relationship. It's just, it's wonderful. I feel like he does. I mean, I'm to stop rambling, but I feel like he, behind the scenes, he works with a lot of, you know, strong black women and great black, black women. And then making a movie about them also is like great. And like such a, even another step forward for him as a filmmaker. So I guess like, what was your experiences like from that aspect, aspect I guess? Yeah, he, he has his own door, Malaysia, <laughs> Malaysia, right? Yeah. He's got his, he's got his, uh, uh King's guard. Yeah. So, you know, I've been, it's been 10 years. This past summer was 10 years since Fruitvale Station, since I met um, Ryan, which time flies. And um, we really just have a shorthand. I mean, I love working with him because I think one of the things, and I, maybe it's a little odd that struck me was he never questioned my ability to do anything. Um, you know, Fruitvale Station was one thing because it was small and, you know, it was like $600,000, somewhere four hundred, six hundred thousand dollars $600,000. Um, so, you know, we, we're, we're doing what we're used to doing in the independent movies. You're kind of cobbling things together and doing, stretching the almighty dollar because you only have four cents for your budget. And then, you know, when Creed came along that at that point, that would have been the biggest movie that I had designed. And I was like, oh, you know, it's an iconic, you know, you're part of an iconic franchise. And I don't know if I it can do this. And Ryan just never thought anything about it. He's like, of course, you know, of course you can. And that type of confidence I think that kind of giving someone the benefit of the doubt, especially black women, especially in, in, in today's world, goes really far to um, open you up creatively, allow you to do the work instead of feeling um, not useful or dismissed or however you may feel. feel. And I feel like, you know, uh, one, we're aesthetically looking, facing the same direction of the things that we see are important for filmmaking, for storytelling, place. I always talked about how he really brought that into my life and made me understand how important it is because his connection to his hometown of Oakland. And I saw that and, and I know how important that is for people to be connected in that way. And that's what I try to bring to Wakanda and Talakan. Um, and so, you know, he's taught me a lot and it's just been a fantastic working relationship and a friendship outside of work. Um, he's just always been one of the most important people to me um, because I feel like I've just, he's made me a better designer and he's made me a better person because he's allowed me to look at the world through a different lens um, without feeling again, you know, I think oftentimes when you're, when you're kind of, alone in your craft because of what you look like and who you are. Um, you don't you don't think you're gonna go any further and nobody really is, you know, giving you the opportunity that you seek. And and he just never questioned it. So it was um, an instant friendship from the first Skype that we that we did all those years ago. And um, we just keep rolling and and I'm always there for him um, and him as well. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a really great friendship and it's really important to me. 
Yeah, I mean, I would say he never like he never misses all of his movies. I think are amazing, including Wakanda Forever. And obviously, I think your collaborations with him are great. We have to wrap up. But last thing is, you obviously you won. Like I said, you won an Oscar, an incredible moment. Where do you have like where do you have your Oscar? Do you have it like displayed, or what did you do with it? I guess. I mean, I it was around the house in a couple places, but it landed. I got like a little cabinet for the um, living room, so it is in the living room. Nice. It's in. The- glass cabinet and every occasionally I'll kind (laughs) of look over at it like oh that happened yes but mostly I have it out as a reminder to never rest on your laurels never become complacent um always be creative and always work different creative muscles so I look up at it and I think um what a privilege it was to to receive that award and never to take that for granted yeah, and I would say your work in this movie uh, shows that you did not, because like I said, it's just uh, like I could not believe how big it just is. Such it's a huge movie. Uh, Wakanda Forever out in theaters now. Hannah Beachler, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. 